My name is Steven Scherdorf, and I'm gay. I am queer. Heterosexual. Androgynous and under the transgender umbrella. I am heterosexual. I identify myself as a gay man. I'm a heterosexual male. I am a homosexual. I am gay. I like men, usually. I'm Mickey Kaufman. I'm a male to female transsexual. The youngest awareness I had of gender identity was around three. Probably around four or five years old. 14 years old, actually, I'm surprised I remember. After seeing the movie Dirty Dancing when I was like, I guess seven or eight, that first dance that Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey have. I joined the Navy mainly to get away from home. I fell in with a group of friends and one of them pulled me aside one day and said to me, well, you're gay. And I said, what is gay? I never heard that, I never heard that word before. In my dream, I was wearing these big earrings like Diana earrings, they look like drawer handles. They were so big and, and pendulous, but they were really beautiful. And I woke up really distraught that I couldn't find them anywhere. And I, and I told my mom I wanted my earrings and I saw the reaction that I got. So I was aware that this was a transgression of some sort. So. I don't think I've ever had a single point at which I became you know, aware of my sexual orientation. I think it's been a sort of ongoing process. As a young adult, I came out as a lesbian, that was the only thing that I could pick. I didn't think that uh, I was homosexual. I thought it was a passing fancy. My mom actually started telling people that, you know, I was bisexual and, you know, sort of outing me before I was even ready to, like, you know, have an opportunity. I told my mother, I told my father, and they were very supportive of it. They didn't overreact. They didn't blow anything out of proportion. They just said, looked at me and said, you're my son and I love you. Some of my family members um, would take their nails and dig them into my back and like arch my shoulders and I would have to like be forced to walk like this because males walked like that. I was teased for my sort of skinny, you know, sort of androgynous body. You're flat chested. That's like a big word in seventh grade. You're so flat chested. It was called titty boy, titty girl. I thought, well, I guess, pfft. I'm never gonna have a boyfriend if that's what it's all about. The way sexuality shaped my life um, has something to do with my profession being an actor. Working in cities like this very closely with a lot of attractive women. Feeling the pressure from my parents to not be gay, I think I kind of turned inward. Playing music, I played the viola, uh, playing the piano, reading. Um, I'm now an editor and a, a writer. Having that instability of gender caused some instability, but it also caused a wisdom. And, gave my understanding and dimension that perhaps is unique and, and, and something I can contribute. I don't define myself by my sexuality. It's a part of who I am, but it's not what I am. Good evening, all of you, and welcome to this session. I'm Andrew Solomon. I'll be your moderator. I feel like a game show host standing here. But in any event, I'm going to be the, um, the moderator in this discussion about uh, the origins of orientation, about sexuality, about desire, um, about the relation between science and politics in these arenas. So welcome to all of you. And let me now welcome our panelists. Meredith Shivers is a clinical psychologist and professor at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Her clinical work has focused on treatment of sexual functioning problems, gender and sexual identity concerns, sexual addiction, and atypical sexual interests. Jim Faust is an internationally known expert in the neurobiology of sexual behavior. His research examines how the brain's neurochemical and neuroanatomical systems are organized for sexual arousal, desire, pleasure, and inhibition. Paul Vasey is a behavioral scientist <laughs> who focuses on sexuality and gender from a biosocial perspective. His research includes the evolution of female homosexual behavior in Japanese macaques and male same-sex attraction in humans in Samoa, Japan, and Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Breedlove <laughs> is 
He is a professor of neuroscience at Michigan State University. He has written over 100 scientific articles about the role of hormones in shaping the developing and adult nervous system, including sexual differentiation of the developing brain. Welcome. Thank you. All of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the opening question that was suggested to me by the conference organizers was, why did you choose to get involved in the area of sexuality? I've just been on an assignment in Brazil where I interviewed the person who is responsible for gay issues in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And I said to him, why do you think there are many gay tourists coming to Rio de Janeiro? And he said, have you gone outside yet? <laughs> so, <laughs> with that model in mind, I turn to all of you and say, why did you decide to do research in this arena? Meredith, why don't you go first? Sure. So uh, as an undergraduate, I was studying um, in Canada at the University of Guelph. I was very interested in neuropsychology and was taking a uh, Bachelor of Science in Psychology, really science-heavy courses. And I needed to bring my GPA up. Things were looking kind of grim in my first year. So I, many of my friends told me that um, I should take a human sexuality class because it was a really easy course. You could get a really easy A that way. And I, I had a couple of experiences in that course that were sort of aha moments that sort of led me into, into this path. So the first one was um, being, a, my, my prof would quite often show very explicit erotic images in class. And, and one of them was a, a very um, explicit, tight close-up of a woman's vulva. And um, so imagine, you know, giant lecture theater, 500 students, massive vulva. And, <laughs> and around me were all of these people going, ew, and most of those people were women. Mm. And, and I, I, just, I had this moment of shock looking around. This is your body. How can, how can you have this kind of, of response to this? And so that kind of got logged in the back of my brain. And then later in that course, um, I gave a, a, a presentation on um, female sexual functioning difficulties. And public speaking has never been my forte, kind of nervous about it, but um, in any case, I walked away from that experience, and I literally had that sort of epiphany moment where I thought, if I could do this for the rest of my life, I'd be a, a really happy woman, and so that, mm. that set me on my path. And Are you a really happy woman? Uh, most of the time. <laughs> I, I, I feel works. pretty lucky to be able to do something I feel really passionate about, and that every day I get up, and I, I get to go play in a laboratory and figure out puzzles, and right. that's mm. wonderful. Fantastic. Jim? Well... Uh, I have to say it was my first orgasm. <laughs> um, it was a profound event. I mean, you think about your first orgasm. What did that feel like? What was it? What were you trying to attain? What did you not expect to have happen to you? And that first orgasm really got me wondering why, A, why my body had never done this before, B, why it felt so good, See, now I kind of understood the Iliad in ways that I didn't before. <laughs> and, and D, more importantly, where did that come from? Did it come from my penis? Did it come from my testicles? Did it come from my, where in my body did it come from? And the idea that it came from my brain, even when I was 14, was a kind of a profound epiphany like mm. you talk about. And I, I just had always been interested in trying to figure that out. So the first thing I did in grad school was try to figure that out. And I got into the idea that sexual reward, where in the brain was it? How was it organized in the brain? And of course, I couldn't study this in people because I couldn't take their brains out. So I had to figure out a way to model this in a little critter like a rat. And the rest was history. I mean, I've, I just have never looked back. Lot told them, don't look back. Yeah, I never looked back. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a very rewarding experience studying sexual reward. Mark. Me. Sorry, Paul. Oh. <laughs> uh, my sex research career started uh, when I was a doctoral student at the University of Montreal. And I had absolutely no funding and there was no uh, uh, funding in sight. So I had to figure out something that I was going to be able to do uh, sort of in the area of, of Montreal. And as uh, luck would have it, the, the University of Montreal had a colony of Japanese monkeys that uh, were used exclusively for behavioral research and really only a handful of people had access, access to them strictly for observational purposes. 
And uh, when I was thinking about what am I going to do for my, for my doctoral dissertation, uh, it was around the time that the mating season w was starting. And there was a lot of female homosexual behavior in the group. Females uh, form uh, these uh, consort pairs, couples, and they, they mount each other, they solicit each other for sex, and this goes on for days. And I thought, wow, that, that is really interesting because anyone that knows anything about evolutionary theory knows that a, a very basic tenet of evolutionary theory is that uh, you, you, uh, you, organisms are supposed to behave in ways to maximize their reproductive success. This behavior didn't look like it was doing that. And so I thought, this is something that I could really sink my teeth into for, uh, for a doctoral dissertation. I went the next day, I drove into Montreal because the facility was outside of Montreal in the country. Mm. And I spoke with my supervisor at the time and told him, this is what I want to do. I want to study female homosexual behavior in Japanese monkeys for my doctoral dissertation. And he said, uh, why would you want to do that? It's biologically irrelevant. Oh. And <clears throat> He said, you should study reciprocal altruism, which I had no interest in. And I very, you know, very dejected, went, drove back to the lab. Uh, at this time, I was actually living in a storage room at the lab because I had no money uh, to, to rent an apartment. So I was living with the monkeys. <laughs> I, I, quite literally, I was living with the monkeys. <laughs> um, got up the next day. Uh, went to, to see the monkeys, and there were five uh, sexual partners. Four of them were female-female, hom female homosexual couples, and one was a heterosexual couple. And I thought, look, anything that's this common, this widespread in the social group, cannot be biologically irrelevant. And I'm going to study this no matter what the consequences are. What? So far, things have worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Consequence is good. Yeah. And now, Mark. Well, uh, you, you'd think with the last name of Breedlove that it would be inevitable, <laughs> right? But, uh, <laughs> but I insist I'm no more obsessed with sex than the uh, average person. Uh, <laughs> in, in fact, I got into science because I, uh, I lived on a farm until I was 10 years old or so. So I've known all my life where uh, fried chicken comes from. I've known the whole uh, process. Um, and, and there I was fascinated with animals. Some of my earliest memories are, I was, I was really interested in this spider that had made a web in one corner of the house. And, I was, um, and it, you know, it was really interesting when an insect would fall there, it would dash out from hiding and then dash back in. And, um, and so I've been uh, you know, really interested in that, in that sort of metaphor of uh, animals as machines. And so how do you understand how their behavior uh, comes about? And, and, and I actually didn't, so when I went to graduate school, it was to try to understand this relationship between the nervous system and behavior. And I wasn't actually interested in hormones my first year in graduate school, but um, you know, I took some courses and as I learned more about hormones, I realized that there was an incredible opportunity here. You inject an animal with a hormone and six hours later, there's a reliable change in the behavior. Well, if you want to understand how the nervous system controls behavior, then all you have to do is trace the hormone, right? Where does it go? What does it do? Uh, what sort of changes does it make? You'd, you'd think, and so it makes it sound like a simple problem, right? So here I am, you know, 30 some years later, and I, I don't have a completely satisfactory answer, but, um, and, and, so, and, and so that's really uh, how I got into, into hormones. And then in terms of sex differences, it's even more compelling. You, you, you take an animal and on the day of birth, uh, you inject it with a hormone, and a long time later in that animal's lifetime, what we would consider decades later, there's a reliable change in the behavior because the animal got that hormone, you know, that one time early in life. Um, and so all you have to do is trace the hormones and, and, and that's enough. That's, that's a, um, a reasonable uh, quest. And, and, and I would say, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm delighted with how it's all come out. I mean, I feel very lucky. I'm, you know, I'm from a blue collar family, obviously. And so uh, I think it's so wonderful that I get to study the stuff that I'm interested in? Well, I think there are an enormous number of questions to be drawn from all of your work and the various ways in which it weaves together. But it seems to me central to consider the question of how we've moved from the definition of sex as primarily the biological imperative through which the species is perpetuated and what the philosophical shifts have been and how the scientific and philosophical shifts have been entwined as we've come to acknowledge that sexuality is not simply a means for um, producing offspring. Uh, there have been huge 
shifts in those areas. There have been huge shifts in the whole way that we think about desire. Um, there have been whole shifts in this question of the ideology of sexuality and what it is that forms these inclinations and wishes. Does anyone want to well, tackle that question? Actually, if I can just jump in. I mean, I think it's been instructive in the... I was taught that rats were little automatons, that they were Nike commercials. You put them together and they'll just do it. <laughs> that there's no learning, there's no social system that might affect their sexual behavior because they're way lower on the totem pole than you know, primates are and they have a social structure. And then humans are like a Monty Python skit, something completely different, right? And it occurred to me that that wasn't true, that there were individual differences in what rats did. Some rats wouldn't do it at all, some would do it a lot. Why were these differences there if the biological drive was the most important thing, right? And it got me to thinking that well, the brain didn't evolve necessarily for reproduction. It evolved to, e to interact with the outside world. And part of the outside world is ever-changing. And it requires a brain that can eh, kind of learn. And that got me into thinking, well, if it's instinctual to learn, what do rats learn about sex? Should they learn anything? Turns out they learn an enormous amount to the point that I can take a rat, put a little rodent jacket on it for its first sexual experience, and get that rat to not be able to have sex without having that jacket on. Which means that the jacket has become a fetish. Now we think of fetish behavior in rats, we think, my god, if they can do it, imagine what we can do. <laughs> the jackets will be available for purchase <laughs> just outside the... Right, right. And, and, um, and, and I think there's been a reciprocal sort of uh, cross-pollination between the animal work and the human work because at the same time that the, the people doing the animal work have come to uh, understand or see the importance of experience, I think the people uh, in, the, in working in human behavior have come to see that nature has some influence as well mm -hmm. and that it's not mm -hmm. just learning. Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, I, I work in Samoa, which is a small island in the South Pacific. I began that research program with uh, my colleague Nancy Bartlett, who's in, in the audience tonight. And um, I mean, there, it's so, I, I, I'm gay, so as a gay man going, going to Samoa to do the research there, um, you know, in, in scientific lingo, we would refer to me as an androphilic male. So I'm a male who's sexually attracted to adult males. So you can go anywhere in the world and find other androphilic males. There are androphilic males in Samoa. And this is sort of getting there are some at... some even here on the stage. There are some <laughs> on the stage. There are, I think there are... There's, there's two by my count. <clears throat> so uh, this is sort of getting at your whole point of how important is socialization. I think that the, 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 the sexual attraction and the sexual arousal, that's biological but then it's elaborated on culturally. So for example, I can go, uh, I can go to Samoa and there are androphilic males there, and, but there are, no, there are no gay men, none whatsoever. Right. Uh, and and you, can, you can talk to these androphilic males who uh, in Samoa they're called fafafine, which means in the manner of a woman. And so they, they, they present publicly, typically in a very feminine manner. They'd be what, in this culture, we refer to as effeminate males, or in many cases, even transgendered males. And they're exclusively sexually attracted to masculine males. Pretty much just like all androphilic males are attracted to masculinity, masculine males, for the most part. But they don't self-identify as gay, so that identity part is socialized. When, when, they, were, when they were growing up, uh, gay, was not an identity category that they could draw upon to construct who they are. Just like when I was growing up, I didn't say, Mom, Dad, sit down, I have something very important to tell you. I'm a fafafine. <laughs> because it wasn't an identity category that I could draw upon. Right. So there's, there's, there's biological predispositions, but they're elaborated on culturally, and those cultural elaborations have all sorts of um, implications in terms of how you self-present in public, what others expect from you. Uh, in s here, in this culture, I'm, I'm expected to behave in a masculine manner. In most places, it's demanded of you. In Samoa, 
uh, that's not the case. You're expected to be feminine and you're expected to have certain roles within the family, certain obligations in terms of taking care of your nieces and nephews. So biology and culture are both important. So I think the very diversity of this panel and the diversity of work that's being done by all of you reflects a growing understanding that sexuality is overdetermined, that in popular culture there is a tendency over and over again to say, um, you know, are people gay because of a gay gene? Can we find it? Then we'll know why all gay people are gay. Are women who are aroused by watching chimpanzees um, for example, that being a piece of the work you do, bonobos, rather. Um, is there a kind of explanation for that that comes from the way that they've been socialized? Can we then understand all female arousal as being based entirely on the way that people are socialized and what happens to them early on? The idea that, in fact, there are these many different factors that are coming together, far more factors than I think we're probably able to name at this point, seems to be one that's gaining currency, and it seems to be one that you're all working toward, it's one of the things that I found cheering in reading the papers that you've all written, that none of you seem to be saying, I figured it out, it's all about this, but rather to be saying, this is a component of a much larger and more complex process. Does that ring true to you? Does that ring true to you for your work, Liz? Uh, absolutely. So um, the research I've done primarily to this point is uh, sexual psychophysiology. And when I, when I was a graduate student, that's when I started doing the research that involved the, the, bonobo, um, the bonobo study where we had women watching an array of sexual stimuli, including a bonobo film, and they showed genital responses to this. Um, and, and this study was initially conducted to demonstrate that really what we were seeing with other studies where uh, straight women, where, where lesbian women were not differentiating between gay, straight, or, or lesbian couples having sex, that it, it wasn't necessarily that, that women, all women were bisexual, which was one sort of really clumsy interpretation of those data, was that maybe there's something, you know, there's a feature to all of these films that, that's common, which is sexual activity, so that's why we did the, the Bonobo study to demonstrate that just showing any kind of sexual activity might generate this physiological response without women necessarily saying that they were feeling aroused. But what this required to be able to begin to interpret these data was just, for me, was a, a, a paradigm shift. So to, to you know, all of the, the, uh, the learning that had come before for me, is, so this was, I was a master's student at this time trying to interpret these data, where what I saw um, very sort of male interpretations of sexuality, male models of female sexuality, and, and here we had these results that completely flew in the face of everything that we understood, or at least we assumed that we understood about how things should shake out with arousal and, and sexual orientation. And so it, it, it's been a process of um, sort of rebuilding how we understand female sexuality, what are the, the gender differences, and how, what are the implications for understanding, for example, sexual orientation. Um, I mean, I'm also interested in other questions, but sexual functioning, but in particular, what does it mean for orientation? Right. I think your question really, <clears throat> uh, at the base of your question is really, what is sexual orientation? So is sexual orientation genital blood flow, genital arousal? Is sexual orientation your identity, what you, what you label yourself? Is sexual orientation who you have sex with, your behavior? It, or is sexual orientation who you're attracted to? Um, what your sexual fantasies are, what your feelings are? I think most sex researchers would say uh, sexual orientation, hope I'm not speaking for <laughs> out of turn here, but I think most sex researchers would say uh, what you're thinking about when you're masturbating is a pretty good uh, in, you know, take on what your, what your sexual orientation is all about. And then once we, once we decide, okay, that's how we're going to measure sexual orientation, I think that we have to think about it in terms of is it just about being attracted to male-bodied individuals who are masculine or female-bodied individuals who are feminine? Or is there an age component? Is there an activity component? Is there a species component? Do zoophiles have an orientation that is distinct? It seems very impoverished to me to describe a zoophile, someone who's preferentially attracted to, say, horses, as being heterosexual or homosexual. That doesn't at all seem to get at what their sexual orientation is. So there's all these sort of layers to uh, sexual orientation. Most of us are attracted to adults. 
but it's so common that we don't even think of that as being part of our, our orientations. And I think back to, I, oh, if, if, if I can just interject, I think also we have this massive cortex that likes to give us single terms that easily define us both to ourselves and to others. So being gay or straight or bi, right? As opposed to being maybe mostly gay, maybe mostly straight, maybe sometimes bi, sometimes not. And to the extent that there's a fluidity, which I don't like that word, but if there is a fluidity to, to, the, to the definition, then it's gonna create a conflict if you behave in a way that's different from what you think you are or from what other people think you are or should be. Right. But I, I think to come back partly to what you've said, but also to what you've said, there is a sense that these categories are constantly being redefined. So we sit here, and in a way, there's almost a comic element to suggesting that we would equate our sexual identities with those of people who are primarily attracted to horses. And yet, gay sexual identity, as we now know it, is a relatively recent invention. I mean, I'm often struck by the idea that um, uh, to be gay not very long ago was uh, an illness and mm. um, uh, a sin and a crime, and now it's an identity which is broadly accepted and openly discussed on stages in Lower Manhattan. <laughs> and I think that the way in which that shift has taken place is very dramatic, and I think it's very difficult to predict what other shifts may take place and what behaviors and practices that now seem bizarre and aberrant, even to those of us who consider ourselves enlightened, will seem less bizarre and aberrant as we come up with a clearer and more profound understanding of what their point of origin is, where they come from. I'm often struck by the smug moralizing that goes on among people who are not pedophiles in relation to people who are pedophiles. I am not myself a pedophile, but I know that I am someone who has various desires that would at one point have been illegal and criminalized, and that it would have been a terrible struggle for me not to act on them or acknowledge them to myself at the time when they would have been crimes and when they would have landed me in prison. I'm relieved that those desires are no longer criminalized. I do believe that it's terribly important to protect children and to protect animals who are not able to be consensual sexual partners. I understand what the philosophical issues are. I still think that these definitions of what constitutes acceptable sexuality and what constitutes unacceptable sexuality, while they are changing, are no more profoundly true and fully resolved now than they were for the Victorians. Does that ring true to any of you? I, I, I mean, clearly uh, such ideas are still in flux and, and, and the, the public's ideas about them uh, are still in flux and changing quite quickly. So, I mean, it might be hard to keep track of this in Manhattan where things are, uh, you know, perhaps not representative of the entire country, but I was really, <laughs> I, I, it's possible. Uh, I was really struck by the, the Pew uh, surveys that, that found, uh, the, the statistic that stayed with me was that 66% of American Catholics thought that homosexuality should be accepted. Well, that's, I mean, that's really astounding. Uh, that's a very fast change. It's not just, it's not just the you know, social change through funerals, is the, the thing that we uh, talk about, where the, the people that are most homophobic are most likely, are oldest and therefore most likely to die. I mean, it's, so clearly, uh, things are changing fast, and, and it's, um, and and I, I think um, the, the sort of research showing that there are, in fact, several different uh, influences on sexual orientation, I think that's, uh, for, for many Americans at least, that seems to be uh, helping them to accept this idea uh, that homosexuality is, is, you know, is not something that has to be treated in the ways you spoke of just a few years ago. I think, though, that there's, there's a, a sort of sadness embedded in those truths that you've shared, which is that much of America appears now to have accepted the validity of being homosexual, being gay, whatever one wants to call it, alternative sexual identities, I think mm -hmm. is one phrase that gets bandied around, but in part around this question of choice. If you've chosen to be gay, then you don't deserve any protections. And if there was nothing you could ever do about it because hormonal events in the womb or some gene or an anomalous construction for hypothalamus are causing this to be the case, then you deserve more tolerance. And it seems to me that that's a very narrow idea of tolerance, the idea that you only tolerate what is inevitable and that you don't tolerate 
the decisions and choices that people make. Mm -hmm. I mean, in all of your work, you're variously looking at hormones, you're looking at various kinds of arousal, you're looking at social conditions, you're looking at these many different things. What is your sense of how much of a role choice plays in, um, in sexual orientation and identity? And what is your sense of the way in which, uh, in which biology and um, biology and choice and experience, how do, they, how do they all interact in your various work? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a heavy question. Yeah. That's probably the heaviest question because nothing happens in a vacuum and things are not static. When you are born, in fact, when you're in utero, your brain is developing. When you're born, your brain continues to develop. When you're engaging in, you know, in, in, in gender appropriate versus inappropriate behavior, whatever the hell that means, your brain is still developing. And you're getting a sense of who you are on the basis of being bad me or good me, being accepted me or unaccepted me. And you, you, you grow in this social circumstance where you learn the rules of engagement, you learn how to get what you need, how to get what you don't need. And ultimately, puberty hits. And all of this then becomes kind of concentrated in terms of blood flow in your genitals. And what is directing that blood flow? Are you directing that blood flow? Or is it being directed by things in the external world that when you see them, you end up with the Wayne's World shawing happening, <laughs> right? And I mean, I say that for both men and women. So the question then is not so much is there a static event that happens, but is there a process that happens? to the point that once you're there, there is no choice. Just as there's no choice that you're not gonna eat a cockroach that you've stepped on. There is no choice. You know what you like. You're not necessarily in knowledge of what you don't like. But once you're there, you're there. And then you get to this embellishing that Paul well, talks I think, about. I think as well you have to say, you have to ask your, this choice question, you have to say, are, can you, are you choosing uh, who you're attracted to? I don't think there, are, there is any good data that, that demonstrates yeah. that we choose to be attracted to male-bodied individuals or female-bodied individuals. Can we choose to act on those feelings? Well, yeah, we can. We can choose to act on them because there are some people who choose not to act on them and, and uh, submit themselves to reparative therapy and try to uh, uh, try to try to uh, not think those thoughts and and act on them. Can we choose our identities? Uh, can we choose? Can we be sexually attracted to adult males, but choose not to identify as gay? Choose rather to identify as straight and be on the the down low. Yeah, absolutely. So we can make choices about behaviors. We can make choices about identity, but we don't we don't make choices about who we're attracted to and what uh, arouses us genitally. I, I, I would agree with that. I wonder whether you would agree with it as being as true for women as it is for men, that being your arena. Well, well just to, to riff off of what Paula said, I think that it's a process of discovery. And I, I absolutely agree that it's, this isn't a choice. Mm. And if I've learned anything in the research that I've done so far is that equating orientation with genital responding is just kind of silly. Um, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit with what the, what the data are saying. Um, and, and certainly, you know, women are not making choices to become aroused to, for example, um, bonobo stimuli. Um, so it, it, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with, with that model. It, one of the things that I, I get concerned about with, you know, we, we brought up this um, idea of fluidity of female sexuality. You know, fluidity really implies that there are sort of this, you know, women have this capacity to sort of be either same or opposite sex attracted. And, you know, we're only beginning to understand what the factors are that contribute to the expression of same and opposite sex attractions. And, um, sexual relationships. But within that is an implication that, so again, talking about reparative therapy, that there is more flexibility in a female sexual system that you can then volitionally say, well, if I have the fluidity to be, you know, same-sex attracted, why can that not be channeled into opposite sex attraction? And I, I think that that's a really dangerous path. I don't believe that that's necessarily the case. Right. I mean, I've been very interested. I've been doing a lot of work on um, people who are trans, um, it's a chapter in a book I'm writing now, 
which is about transgender children and their families. And the question there is a much more vital one, I think, in serious academic circles, the question of reparative therapy than it is for gay people. I mean, the idea of reparative therapy for gay people is now largely relegated to a kind of right-wing extremism mm -hmm. and religious fundamentalism. There are still a great many people, Ken Zucker leading among them, but others who follow in that model, who say that being transgender is actually, um, in effect, that it's ridiculous. I mean, he said at one point, the idea of accommodating these children because the child comes home and says, mommy, I'm really a girl, when you can see perfectly well the child is a boy. He said, I mean, it's like he said, you know, it's like if this child who's black came home and said, I'm really white, you wouldn't start bleaching their skin. You would try to teach them to be comfortable with who they, there's all of this conversation that goes on about anatomy as destiny and so on and so forth. In looking at the arguments that have gone on around whether people who are trans should be cured or not, it's hard not to see, I mean, it's impossible not to see parallels to the way that people who are gay have been treated, to the sort of the gender shock issues, the ways in which various kinds of therapies were used to convert gay people. It's difficult, though, reading all of the literature to decide whether the situations are the same or whether they're different. And I wonder what everyone's take would be on gender identity as opposed to sexuality and how they're fixed or how they're fluid. In terms of gender identity, I mean, one, one difference is, you know, that if, if a child decides that they should be the other sex, and if that continues to unfold, um, you know, in, in that uh, pathway, then there's a question of having surgery at some point, et cetera. And, and so, and it's difficult to know. I mean, at what point does a child actually know their own mind? And it's um, for the same reason we don't let them vote and we don't let them, uh, you know, make other decisions about, about their medical treatment, then, then there's this, this tough situation that I think therapists are in. Um, uh, to, you know, to what extent do you uh, um, you know, help the child uh, down this pathway, or if you can persuade the child to be happy with the anatomy they've got, aren't you, aren't you doing the child uh, a favor? And then, and then, you know, so how far do you go to try to persuade the child uh, to be happy with the, in, with, the, with the sex they were born into is, I mean, I, th I think it's a tough call um, always. And <clears throat> not persuade them in a punitive way. I mean, my, I, think, I think Ken Zucker is often vilified and unfairly I'd, uh, my understanding of, uh, uh, of what Ken is trying to do is make these kids more comfortable with the bodies that they have. And the reason he's doing that is because, um, and Meredith might be able to articulate this more clearly than I, I, I can, but what, what, what I think Ken is trying to do is make them more comfortable with the bodies they have because it's difficult at that age to identify, is that child really g going to grow up to be trans? because the vast majority of those children that are diagnosed with something called gender identity disorder, which is sort of like a transsexualism or indicator of transsexualism in childhood, the vast majority of those kids will not grow up to be trans. So Ken, I think what he's trying to do is help them be comfortable growing up to be gay men and lesbian women. Is that fair, Merida? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, the data on which these, um, that this hypothesis is based is not as rich as we'd like it to be. There's one longitudinal study that Richard Green had done following um, boys with gender atypical behavior, and what, about 70% of those grew up to be gay men. Still a substantial percentage who are identifying as trans, but um, yeah, I think that's fair. And, and, and you have to feel like it's a better outcome if, when they reach puberty, they, they, they find that they're perfectly happy to have a penis, right? That, that, that they don't, I mean, that that's, um, that that's, you know, a better outcome for the child. And, I, and, I, once, well, these, and once these kids hit uh, adolescence, it just should be said that Ken is completely on board with supporting them in terms of yeah. their choices because he recognizes uh, if, if, if there's a teen that's uh, identifying as trans, that that is, the, all the data suggests that that is very unlikely to change, right. as opposed to point. someone who is prepubescent. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was struck one of the children whom I interviewed in doing that work, who was incredibly clear about the fact that she was a girl, she had been born with this male body, she didn't know why, but she was a girl, and she was just, so, and it was all incredibly clear and straightforward, and her family had been immensely supportive, mm -hmm in what appeared to be, in this instance, a very positive way, and she was living as a girl, and 
I mean, the issue, of course, and I don't want to get off onto this tangent, but of going on puberty blockers and not developing mm. secondary sexual characteristics of the other gender, for people who will be trans, there are advantages mm -hmm. to identifying in that way early on and not having to go through a much more difficult transition after puberty. Um, so the issues are complicated. But in any event, we had this long conversation, and um, uh, then I said, just kind of whimsically, and I said, and I said, tell, tell me, where do you think you'll live when you grow up? And she said, um, I think that I'll live in a tree house in California with hair long enough to reach Arizona. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay. I mean, the fantasy life, the real life, what's right. an authentic right. revelation, what's obviously transient, these things can be, can be very complicated. I'm concerned about the work that everyone is involved with, which is about really the etiology of sexual orientation, because I'm concerned that in almost every instance in which the origins of any form of difference have been identified, the knowledge of those origins has been used in many instances in attempts to eliminate that identity. So um, there was a story I was told which I found which was very sad to me, um, that there's this work that I think all of you are, uh, are well aware of that's shown that women who have multiple sons, the likelihood of one of those, of a son being gay increases, correct me if I'm not mm -hmm. describing this correctly, but increases the more sons that the mother has. With each additional son, mm -hmm. the likelihood that child will be gay increases by yeah. a substantial percentage. So I and my husband had children through surrogacy, and I got quite interested in the area of surrogacy and talked to a lot of surrogates. And one of the people I talked to said that she had, had, um, a, she had been a surrogate six times. Now, when you're looking for surrogates, one of the things you want to look for is someone who is both physically and emotionally prepared to deal with the challenges that are attached to being a surrogate, to relinquishing a child whom you've carried, and so on and so forth. So, Surrogates, in general, the sort of popular wisdom has been, it's better if you can to get someone who has some experience. This woman described having someone who had actually gone a, a, quite a long way toward working with her, who then read those statistics and said, you've actually been a surrogate, you've produced three boys, that means that if we conceive a male child whom you carry, the likelihood that that child will end up being gay is much higher. We're not going to work with you. We want to find someone fresh and new. And it was an indication in that specific and narrow situation, which is not one that will be reproduced constantly, but of the ways in which people, once they have an idea, oh, it has to do with androgen levels in utero, you know, can we test those androgen levels and can we abort the fetus if we discover the androgen level is too high? Oh, it's a genetic question. How can we find the gene? So how does the work that you do, which is essentially I think about, at some grand level, not only identifying but also supporting the diversity of sexual experience, how do you deal with the implications it may have in narrowing those very possibilities? I, I, I think this gets at a great divide between the people doing the research and the public that's hearing about it. That gets at the idea you talked about, about how overdetermined human behavior is, certainly sexual orientation. So, um, you, you know, we have to work so hard just to find any influence because there are so many different influences and you can only uh, find an influence by isolating one little factor at a time. And so, uh, and so for those folks, uh, I can tell you the statistics are that you have to have something like 12 older brothers just to have a 50-50 chance of being gay, right? But, but, but people don't understand that you can never uh, point to a given individual and say this individual is gay because they have an older brother right. because of course there are lots of, most men out there with seven older brothers uh, are, are straight. Um, and, and so we have to sift through the statistics to find the fact that that influence is there and it's been very well replicated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it's, and it's an interesting statistic in that older brothers increase the chance of a boy being gay, but only if that boy is right-handed. If the boy is left-handed, then this influence, whatever it is, um, doesn't come into play. And and, and then when you realize, you know, seven older brothers and still most likely to be, that it would be silly, even, even if you thought it was okay to try to stop people from growing up to be gay, it would be crazy to go at it that way because it's such a tiny little influence that you have to use statistics to find it. And so it's not that it lets you know why this individual is gay. On the other hand, when, the, when you look at the statistics and find that effect there every time, you have to ask yourself, well, how can that be? That's something that happened not just before this person was born, but before they were conceived, 
change the probability of what their sexual orientation would be. You know, how, do you, how do you square that with the idea of choice, right? That they, I mean, who chose to have four older brothers, right? You, that's, that's, a, that's a strange idea. Paul, what about plus, a oh, sorry. Uh, I, I was just going to say, plus then you have the baffling array of possible genes. There's not going to be one gene. There's going to be multiples which act on each other, which act on each other during these developmental epochs that, that I discussed earlier, which, you know, at the end point, I don't think you're ever going to be able to make a prediction from one of those. And I would guarantee you, if in some draconian future, you could identify many of these and knock them all out, probably you'd kill the fetus. So the question then is, well, you know, is this then a trait, is homosexuality a trait for survivability? And if it is, I guarantee you the people doing the killing are going to be ousted very quickly because you want that in the population. You don't not want it in the population. Well, wanting it in the population is exactly what I was going to ask you about. What role do you think that the um, difficult to pronounce Fafafine, Fafafine mm -hmm. um, uh, play in Samoa and why do you think there's a cultural value on that role in that society in a way that there isn't in some others? Well, a lot of my research in Samoa is really focused on, okay, if there are genes for, for same-sex sexual attraction in males, which it looks like there are, we might not be able to identify what the specific genes are, but various bits and pieces of information all point to the direction that there's a, there's a genetic basis for this. How are these genes maintained in a population if these individuals, for the most part, at least in Samoa, are not reproducing? So one of the one, one of the theories is that, well, you might not reproduce yourself directly, but you might uh, help your close relatives, like brothers and sisters, reproduce by taking care of their children for them and therefore allowing them to produce more children with whom you share genes and therefore you're passing on genes indirectly uh, in the population through your nieces and nephews. So the research we've been doing in Samoa has shown over and over and over again that fafafine, these uh, males who are sexually attracted to adult masculine men, <clears throat> are more avuncular, they're more uncle-like in terms of their tendencies than women and men. So they, they clearly, no matter how many times we attempt to test this and test it in different ways and falsify it, we never can. This effect is real. Fafafine are more uncle-like than men and women in Samoa. And this is consistent with this kin selection hypothesis for male same-sex sexual attraction. Why does that exist? Well, we're, we're working on it, but one, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons it might exist is uh, on a very proximate social level is that there, there, is, there is an expectation among Samoans that fafafine play an important role in terms of, and this is something you hear over and over again, people in Samoa say, bringing the family together. They, they're the glue that holds the family together. They bring the family together. Um, so when you're, when, you, when, you grow, when you're a little fafafine growing up in that social system, and this is, these are the messages that are being fed to you, this is now your social role. This is what's expected by your community and your family. Um, and just getting back to this whole idea of the science and, and it being scary and having these negative, uh, potential negative effects on society, just, just the, uh, the, the avuncularity research we've been doing in Samoa has been nothing but a good news story because there's all of these you, you think about conservative uh, Christian groups in North America saying homosexuals are destructive to the family. Well, all of the research in Samoa shows the exact opposite. Um, they're, they're integral in terms of bringing the family together, making the family stronger, raising the nieces and nephews. Right. That's and a good, that's a good news a, story. providing a sexual outlet for adolescent heterosexual males. That's sometimes that's the case, yes. I didn't by any means wish to suggest that the science should be stopped to achieve a social agenda. I'm only struck by the irony that exists, certainly exists in certain areas of disability like deafness, that just as the idea of deafness has gained 
political ascendancy and deaf people have been more broadly socially accepted, the advent of the cochlear implant has meant effectively that there are fewer and fewer deaf people and that there is sometimes a kind of strange crossing between scientific insight um, and the cures that it may represent, which are in a future draconian or otherwise that's very distant in this arena, but that nonetheless is not unimaginable and have, could have its roots in the kind of work that we're discussing here, that there can be a dramatic relationship between the, um, uh, the political acceptance and liberation and the scientific research, which then diminishes the population for whom those um, uh, achievements have been arrived at. It would, it would never be a reason not to make the scientific progress, and no. the scientific progress hopefully would enable choice rather than cause that closing down. But mm -hmm. they are still, they're complicated questions that are at the margins, I think, of a lot of what um, all of you are doing. Um, Meredith, when we were back in the green room, you said that your newest research had given you some very surprising results <laughs> that um, uh, altered, in a way, the previous work you've done. Sure. Share them with us. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give a little bit of, of, of preamble. So, um, some the, the research that I'd conducted as a graduate student and then as a postdoctoral fellow um, is the, the one that's been sort of most publicized. Um, looking at women's sexual response in the laboratory and um, responsiveness to male and female sexual stimuli. And sort of the really surprising thing is that uh, we, what we'd initially found is that women, regardless of whether they're same or opposite sex attracted, were showing significant genital responses to both male and female sexual stimuli. That was sort of the initial study that I did as a part of my doctoral thesis. And then I did a postdoctoral study which suggested that um, women who were same-sex attracted sort of rarify the stimuli. Previously, we were using films of couples, and, and there's so much going on in that. We stripped it down to just solitary women and men. And in using these films of solitary women and men, demonstrated that women who identified as lesbian, who were same-sex attracted, were actually starting to differentiate in their arousal patterns. So they were becoming a little bit more aroused to, to the women than to, to the men. Um, but the, the straight women were not differentiating by gender. And so we, we've taken this a little bit further, and so um, I, two years ago, started an assistant professor position at Queen's University in, in Kingston, and have done a study with primarily bisexually attracted uh, women, and rolled them into this sort of data analysis, this ongoing study of trying to figure out what's going on. You know, this, this pattern of arousal just doesn't fit with, again, as I said, sort of this male model of how things are supposed to work. If you're turned on by these people, if you're choosing to have sex with these people, well, you should become only sexually aroused by those people, so, you know, why both? And as we've rolled this data together, um, I've looked at um, these patterns of arousal to, to women and to men in women who report no sexual attraction to women at all, so exclusively heterosexual women, and then to women with varying degrees of, of same-sex attraction. And so in, um, in, in this research, we use, commonly use a Kinsey scales to sort of have people quantify the, the degree of their same and opposite sex attraction. So a Kinsey zero is a person who's exclusively heterosexual. A Kinsey one is an individual who says, I'm predominantly heterosexual, but I definitely have some same sex feelings, and so on. It goes up to, to sixes. And what, we've, what I found is that the, the, the people who are the big puzzle are the heterosexual women. Um, and uh, all of the other, the, 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 the women with some degrees of same-sex attraction, what's really fascinating is uh, sort of as you go up that Kinsey scale from, you know, just a little bit same-sex attracted to exclusively same-sex attracted, this uh, arousal to women becomes more and more and more differentiated from that of men. But the women who do not differentiate at all are the heterosexual, the exclusively heterosexual women. And so this is very, very recent data. It's not even published yet. We're in the process of, of writing this up. But we've, we've replicated this both using audiovisual sexual stimuli as well as audio stimuli, so stories that are, are describing sexual interactions. And so the, the question becomes, what is going on with mm -hmm. heterosexual women? And sort of, you know, responding to some of these questions about, you know, studying sexual orientation, we're not just studying sexual minorities. Mm -hmm. We're studying orientation as a phenomenon itself. And I never thought I'd be in this position of saying, wait, straight women are the ones <laughs> that we really don't get. This doesn't fit with the model. But again, you know, maybe the model doesn't work. We need to re-examine 
all of our previous assumptions that led us to developing this model of, of what the relationship is between patterns of sexual attraction, arousal, and orientation, and come up with a new one that fits the data. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. Right. <laughs> and the part of your previous work that mm -hmm. I found most interesting was the, and again, correct me if I'm not characterizing it correctly, but that you were using both um, physical instruments to measure people's arousal and giving people some sort of device through which they could give a self-report yes. of arousal. Yes. And that there was frequently an enormous gap between Absolutely. what people thought they were aroused by and what they were actually aroused by. Yeah. I thought yeah. that, in terms of the social conditioning questions mm -hmm. we've been discussing, was fascinating. What, what is your spin on that? Why does that happen? Well, <laughs> great question. Don't have an easy answer. Uh, but this is a very well replicated gender difference that, uh, that for men, the agreement between their physiological responses as well as their, their self-report of how turned on or aroused that they feel, the, the correlation or agreement is very strong. And, and for women, the, there is a, a, a significant correlation between those, but it tends to be much smaller. The effect is, is much smaller. It, I mean, it's really striking when you see in, in a study like with the, the Bonobo film, where women are having this, what seems like a very automatic physiological response is you know vaginal vasocongestion the onset of which is seconds from the onset of the film itself and the women are reporting that they're not feeling turned on at all same as you know watching a lesbian woman watching gay male porn and saying she's not turned on at all and yet you know she's exhibiting this very strong physiological response um, and I, I mean the simplest answer is that psychological experience of sexual arousal is just not dependent solely on this this physiological experience of, of genital vasocongestion you know some have have speculated that this has something to do with genital anatomy women's genital anatomy much more hidden penis far more obvious um, giving off all kinds of obvious cues of, of arousal but this pattern of disconnect in emotional responding is not exclusive to sexual responding. So, you know, emotion theorists who are looking at other aspects of, for example, anxiety and so on, have noticed these kinds of gender differences. So I think we may be observing a phenomenon that's not exclusive to sexuality. Right. Um, I'm very interested in the, in the larger question. I mean, we're looking at models from all of you variously of sexuality which is based on social um, uh, circumstance, based on hormones, um, based on the leather jackets on rats, based on a society that accepts people. But I am also interested in whether what the scientific experiences or what the scientific language is to describe the aspect of sexuality that's founded in love, or indeed the aspect of love that's founded in sexuality. Because while I think it seems almost certainly not to be the case, at least for most people, that how they're parented determines who they desire sexual, what gender they desire sexually. There's a lot of evidence that early experience predisposes you to reproduce certain kinds of emotional relationships that abused children often end up finding um, uh, love in situations in which that abuse is replicated and so on and so forth. And I just wonder, I know it's a kind of sexuality was already sort of a mushy topic and love makes it worse, but where does where do perceptions of love fit into the work that each of you is doing? Well, one thing that <clears throat> love sometimes gets, I don't know, shall we say reduced to, is bonding. Mm. Now there are many kinds of bonding. I mean, we bond to our cats, we bond to our partners, we bond to our parents, we bond to our children. but. There is a common brain system that, that actually activates that bonding in all of those circumstances, whether it's a, ro a romantic bonding or the attachment that a couple feels 30 years after they were married. They're, the work of oxytocin in the brain is absolutely critical for all of those bonding experiences, right? Including and maternal bonding. Including maternal bonding, clearly. And, and what, what's striking is as you read the scientific literature on maternal bonding, and if you know something about the bonding of, you know, say, prairie voles to each other after their first magnificent sexual experience, they all involve the activation of oxytocin in the same areas of the brain. Clearly there is functioning in the cortex that's identifying your sex partner as being different from your child, and your child as being different from your sex partner, from your cat, I hope. But you, 
the, the fact that you're getting the same areas of the brain activated by this particular, and activating this particular neurotransmitter, led us to start looking at this function in rats, because rats are allegedly polygamous. So they want to, males want to spread the genes far and wide in the pool. Females want to spread their genes far and wide in the pool. So females will accept you if you're a swizzle stick, if you're a rat, if you're maybe something else, et cetera, et cetera. So we started to look at this because, as it turns out, a very simple conditioning procedure where the exposure to their first sex partner who's wearing a, an almond odor. Now, almond is neutral. These animals don't care about this. But if you do this, and they learn that their first sex partner is an almond-scented partner. You give them a choice between an almond-scented and unscented partner, and they will copulate preferentially with the almond-scented partner. So why would a polygamous animal do that? That's dumb. Unless, unless and this, this gets to your idea of kind of rethinking these old, tired ideas mm -hmm. about the way things work, unless maybe the brain is neither polygamous or monogamous, it's really opportunistic. And whatever you learn in these early critical periods of sexual behavior development, your early experiences with reward are telling you that that reward comes in this almond package. Well, it turns out if you give them the almond odor, you activate oxytocin in the brains, but only in the ones that had their initial sexual experiences with the almond-scented partner. And I think that's a metaphor for what happens in humans. Because there are facial structures, there's hair color, there's strain differences, size, whatever it might be, that we are each individually uniquely attracted to that activate it's this very, bonding process. It's a very, very Freudian idea, mm. that idea that right. that early experience is that richly determinative of who one is capable of loving, who one will be drawn to. I mean, it's, I, yeah. I, I kind of like Freud, but it's not a very fashionable perspective. But it, maybe it's one that needs to come back. You know, uh, Keith Kendrick in England did a study with sheep and goats, and he cross-fostered them or gave them their regular sheep or goat moms. And it turns out that the males that were cross-fostered preferred, and in fact, uniquely preferred, to have sex with the, a sexually receptive partner that was of the cross-fostered species. So if you're a male goat, and you were cross-fostered with a sheep mom, you have a choice. You can have sex with a sheep, female sheep or a female goat. Guess what? You're a male goat, cross-fostered with a sheep mom, you go after the sheep female. Mm. So why is that? And is it mom, or is it just the reward that's associated with being nursed by mom, being comforted by mom, being taken care of? And it, it turns out it's probably related to the activation of the reward pathways in the brain that then activate the oxytocin. So when you see your loved one, you say, that gives me reward. I want that. Come to me. Cuddle with me. All of that is reward, opioid activation in your brain, activating dopamine and oxytocin. But that study does open up the idea that early childhood experience and the nature of the Absolutely. nurturance you receive could, in fact, be the determining factor in sexual orientation, back to our theme of the evening. What do you make of well, that? But, but, but people have looked for those things, including looking for studying the sort of, you know, I talked earlier about how we have to work so hard to find any evidence of an influence. So people have worked hard to find whether, you know, having a, a cold, distant father uh, um, makes one more likely to grow up to be gay, et cetera. And, 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 you know, when I hear those things, you know, there's always the chicken and egg problem or the cause and effect. You know, is, is the father cold and distant because, uh, the because child I mean, gay. is the and child gay feminine. because the father's cold and distant or is the father cold and distant because he sees his child growing up to be gay. But even, so you'd think that it would be there, but people look really hard for those correlates and you just don't find them. So, mm -hmm. so in terms of, I mean, of course it matters in terms of, you know, are you attracted to, to blondes or people in flashy cars, I suppose, or, uh, you know, all those Disney movies, I'm sure they're, you know, they're pushing that image out there all the time <laughs> uh, about, uh, not the flashy cars, but, um, uh, but, and so I'm sure those things matter, but in terms of basic sexual orientation, you know, the, the data just don't seem to bear that out. But in a way then, that brings us to another question that's, I think, very much, uh, implied by all of what we've been discussing, which is that it is obviously easier to do a lot of controlled experiments on sexuality by cross-fostering goats and sheep than by cross-fostering human beings. But is human sexuality, I mean, almost all of you, you have, well, not including the bonobos, but you've all done work which has in various ways involved animals. 
how much um, can we generalize from what we determine to be uh, true of the sexuality of other animals to human beings, and how much are human beings a completely distinct set well, of questions? Well, every species is a unique species. Every, every species has a unique evolutionary history. So we have to, I've, I've studied Japanese macaques, and I've studied humans as well. Um, we have to be very careful about um, you know, generalizing from one species to the next, because every species is unique. But I can take what I've learned in Japanese macaques and use that as a model for how sexuality might be potentially organized or potentially developed in humans. It doesn't mean that that's the case, but I can uh, use the Japanese monkeys as inspiration for how I might think about uh, sexuality in humans and testing hypotheses about sexuality in humans. Well, why don't you, as someone who's particularly focused, really, on two specific populations, what are the ways in which what you've learned from the macaques is relevant to what you've learned about the Samoans? And what are the ways in which it, it is? Is there a connection, or are they just two separate things you happen to be doing? That's a question I get asked all the time. And there, it's, there, there isn't an easy answer, you know, a, an easy sound bite. The, 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 the female homosexual behavior in the Japanese macaques, for, for a long time, those kinds of same-sex sexual behaviors in animals have been characterized by biologists as being what's called sociosexual behaviors. So these are behaviors that are superficially, they look sexual, but the argument has always been, but the animals aren't doing it because it's sexual. They're doing it to facilitate some sort of adaptive social goal, like alliance formation or dominance demonstration or reconciliation. In other words, it's an adaptive behavior to bring about some functional social goal. Uh, it doesn't look at all, like that's what's happening in Japanese macaques, um, which is, which was a, a, a bit of a shocker for me as, as a doctoral student because I realized, wow, I'm not, the animals haven't read the same evolutionary <laughs> textbooks that I've read. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And suddenly, uh, my job is a lot more complicated. I'm no longer standing on the shoulders of giants. I have to completely rethink uh, my, uh, ha ha why they're doing what they're doing, what models I'm using. It doesn't look like it's an adaptation. So I, I've, I've uh, you know, it's been almost 20 years now that I've been studying the Japanese macaques, and I think what, what's happening is that there are very, in the populations that I work in, there are very high levels of female male mounting, so this non conceptive or non-reproductive heterosexual behavior. So it's very common during a heterosexual interaction that uh, a, a male, for example, might get tired. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're multiple, uh, mount, they, they, they mount each other multiple times before an ejaculation takes place. Series mounting. The male mounts the female, a few pelvic thrusts, he sits back down. <laughs> the male mounts the female, few pelvic thrusts, sits back down. This goes on for hours before he ejaculates. So he can, he can get a bit distracted. Other females might solicit him for sex. He can get a bit tired. And if he's not mounting the female at the pace that she wants him to mount, then she will perform a mount on him. She will either mount prompt him or she will mount him and perform pelvic thrusts against him, sometimes while he masturbates. And then this seems to sort of reset his brain, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm with you. And he swings around behind her and starts mounting again. So from, from a female's perspective, that female-male mounting looks like it's an adaptation. It's a way that females can control male movement and uh, get the male that they want to inseminate them to do what he has to do. Once you have that, you have a system where females are capable of mounting. But why would, the, why would that female mounting then spill over, so to speak, into a female-female context when I've just told you there's no social function to that behavior? Mm. Well, in order to understand why that adaptive behavior might spill over into a female-female context, you have to think, then start thinking about the behavior from a proximate perspective. And during the vast majority of these mounts, females are stimulating their clitorises. 
They do so either by rubbing their clitorises against their partners or by stimulating their clitorises with their tails during the mounts. So at that point in the evolution of the species, we have females that can mount, we have females that derive immediate sexual reward from mounting, and then if they can do that with a male, they can just as easily do it with a female, and the behavior spills over, so to speak, as an evolutionary byproduct into a female-female context. So none of them are exclusively lesbian? None of them are, no. I think that, so your question was, how does that, how does that relate to humans? Well, I think that, you know, we can often think about is male homosexuality an adaptation? Maybe we should be thinking about it more like we think about the Japanese macaques. Maybe it's not an adaptation. Maybe it's a byproduct of something else. And the best data to date suggests that um, maybe it's a byproduct of elevated fecundity in the female kin of male homosexuals. So let me explain that. The idea, the idea is that there are genes for male androphilia, or there are genes for androphilia being attracted to adult males. If you pass these genes onto your son, you produce a male homosexual who's not going to reproduce. If you pass these genes onto your daughters, you produce females that are more fecund. So the basic prediction that one derives from this hypothesis is that the female kin of male homosexuals should be more fecund, they should be having more babies. And in the various populations where this has been studied to date, in Italy and in England and in Samoa, uh, we found that this is indeed the case. The categories of female kin, such as the mothers of fafafine, we compare them to the mothers of straight men in Samoa, we found multiple times now with different studies that the mothers of Fafafine are more fecund than the mothers of straight guys. You do the research in Italy with gay guys and straight guys there. The ants, the maternal ants, the mothers, and uh, uh, the maternal grandmothers of gay guys are all more fecund. They're having more babies than the equivalent in straight guys. So maybe the male homosexuality in humans is a byproduct of selection for these genes which increase fecundity in their female kin. That's a complicated answer to your question, I know, but... It's a fascinating answer. But it's all about thinking outside the box and thinking, well, it wasn't an adaptation in Japanese macaques. It looks more like it's a byproduct of an adaptation which immediately gets more complicated. And it doesn't look like it's an adaptation in humans. Maybe it's a byproduct of an adaptation. And whenever you start talking about byproducts of adaptations, the, the narrative, so to speak, gets a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in that question of how the animal work applies to humans, I mean, it's always a question in your mind. So, you know, for like 25, 30 years, I'd been studying sex differences in the structure of the brain of animals where you know, some areas are masculine uh, in, and other areas are, uh, in some areas the, the, the brain region is larger in males and in females, and in other areas it's the other way around. And in the animal models, I can make each animal's brain as masculine or feminine as I want, simply by controlling the exposure to testosterone. Right? Usually I have to expose them to testosterone early in life, and that will masculinize their brains. But you know, for most of my career, I mean, I, I, as I told you, I was studying that because I want to know how to control behavior. I was very skeptical about whether any of that was that working in humans. Um, you know, I, I spent all day yesterday at the Bronx Zoo, and as a biologist, you're walking around, you see sex everywhere, right? You see sex differences uh, everywhere. Um, but, and, and you see how compelling it is. But on the other hand, all of the individuals that were engaging in higher order symbolic communication were on my side of the glass. Right? They were the ones who were talking to each other, you know, telling each other, you know, don't do that or, or do that. Um, and, and so you really wonder, as Jim says, the, these enormous brains between our ears, you know, to what extent does all that, you know, sort of override any biological influences? And I, I think, for me at least personally, the surprise has been that you can find uh, evidence of biological influences too. It's just not going to be, but as you say, it's not going to be that hormone level alone uh, makes a difference. It's one of the players and it's having an influence and sometimes when we're lucky we can see evidence for that influence, but it's, you know, it's one part of the puzzle. 
I think people are very drawn to the idea of those uh, of there being a connection. I think I don't know if any or all of you read the children's book that was written about the gay penguins in the Central Park Zoo, mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, and uh, Tango makes three uh, penguins who, in fact, were at the Central Park Zoo and who then, uh, when uh, two male penguins settled a nest together, as the other penguins had eggs to take care of um, as penguin couples, they didn't, and they eventually found a rock and put it in their little nest and took care of it. And the zookeeper ultimately um, uh, swapped out the rock and gave them a, a little baby penguin of whom they were the doting parents. One of them subsequently, the um, two parent penguin, ran off with a female penguin. That, <laughs> that did not, that, that unfortunate episode was not in the children's book, no. <laughs> Sorry, my microphone is detaching. Um, but I think there is a kind of longing to think that there is a purity of explanation available. And there certainly is instantly an impulse when you talk about the cross-fostering of sheep and goats to think, Oh wow, that's so interesting. It's just like you know my cousin Susan, who did this crazy thing with her. Um, and uh, I think part of what's both fascinating and frustrating about this work is that there are so many fascinating studies and so many fascinating insights, and it's so difficult to put them together into a single coherent constellation. So you're all doing amazing work. It's all fascinating. It's all incredible. And I don't know how it can be assembled, or whether it can be assembled. Well, one assemblage comes with the idea that when you look at the evolution of the brain from amphibians on up, you see common structure. And even though the brains may be smaller or larger, the common, at least subcortical structuring, is identical. Now, it turns out that's very important for sexual behavior. It's very important for processing stimuli. So a good example is clitoral stimulation, as you were referring to with the Japanese macaques. Where is it represented in the brain? So Barry Komisarik over across the river in, at, at Rutgers has done brain imaging studies, looking at women who are getting clitoral stimulation to orgasm. And he finds a, 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 a distinct regions of the brain that are activated by the stimulation alone and by the stimulation when it produces orgasm. There are added areas that get activated. Turns out, when I'm giving clitoral stimulation to my female rats, it's the same areas that are activated, right? Now, when I see that, I am struck by the fact that nature, Mother Nature loves a keeper. If it works, she doesn't, she doesn't putz with it. It's going to work. It's going to work in a, in a macaque. It's going to work in a rat. It's going to work in a human. And I'm struck by the fact that I can stimulate other areas of the female and not get that. So it's really specific to her clitoris. And then I'm struck by the fact that, well, if I take out her ovaries, so I'm removing the hormonal influences, the clitoral stimulation is still desired by the female rat, right, who will come to my poor graduate student as she's moving her arm out of the cage and grab it by her teeth and pull her arm back in, right, because she's got, she's got the magic little paintbrush, right? So I look at this and I say, well, that's, that's fabulous. Like, why would that happen? Is there a human counterpart to that? Well, sure there is. Postmenopausal women who are not taking hormone replacement still masturbate. So what is that? It's a homology. And it means that really we're all the same creatures, but we have a massive cortex, like you were saying, that allows us to give language and meaning to it that perhaps animals don't do. Well, they give language and meaning to it, but also to have a context in which there's a particular role that's assigned in... Yep. Samoan society, mm -hmm. which is different from the role in New York today, which is different from Utah today or from England in 1850. What do you make as the our token woman here <laughs> <laughs> of this idea of the, the relationship between what you have observed in female sexuality and the impulse toward reproduction, which kind of popular culture would propose that female sexuality is much more tightly linked to reproduction and less random than male sexuality? Well, I, I think that one of the things that I've been struck by is how divergent, at least 
what I've been looking at with, with sexual arousal has been from what would be that expected pattern that would be associated with reproduction. I don't think anybody would have expected that heterosexual women would be the ones who are getting turned on by both women and men. You know, but what I want to understand are the proximal mechanisms for, for those kinds of patterns of arousal. Um, so I, I, I think that you know, coming back to this idea of sort of re-examining and rethinking uh, the models that have been informing the way that we've been uh, studying this, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about as the token female, I need to you know, talk about um, uh, female sexual minorities a bit more. So uh, the, a lot of the research that we've been talking about on sexual orientation has primarily been done looking at male sexuality. You know, there's, there, there's a, a few studies here and there that have looked at what's happening in lesbian women, but really this is a, an uncharted frontier. And you know, to come back to something that, that Jim was talking about, the, the cross-fostering study, I was hoping you would take it and talk about what happens with the, the female um, sheep and goats. Uh -huh. But so, so here we have the, the cross-fostered males who are preferentially going to that which raised them, um, and then what happens with the, the females, and well, they can go either way. Mm. So the same mechanisms, at least in, in these animals, don't seem to be working. And so I'm, at, I'm in the position, and the researchers who are you know, sort of bold enough to get into this, where we're not standing on the shoulders of giants, to try to, to build a model of understanding female sexuality that can in some way be informed by what we've learned about, about men, but to also understand the uniqueness of female sexuality and the role of um, reproduction. You know, we do different stuff. Women and men are different. And we have to begin to incorporate that and understand that from a female perspective. Right. We're getting close to the end, but you bring up a question which is actually implied in a lot of the other research here, which is, are women and men different? And if women and men are different, to what extent do the behaviors that lie outside of normative heterosexuality represent people acting according to the norms of another gender, which is much of what you're describing in Samoa, for example, and to what extent is homosexuality, bisexuality, paraphilias, whatever they may be, to what extent are those things actually typical of someone's biological gender but represent another way of expressing that gender rather than a way of accommodating the standards of the other gender. We have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, one of the things that, that, that we were discussing among ourselves earlier today is, is how uh, gay men, uh, in a way, uh, present quite a mixed picture, at least in, in our society, in that um, they, you might consider them feminine in some ways in terms of who they are attracted to, uh, but on the other hand, or in terms of mental rotations, where men tend to be better at that than women, um, and, uh, and, and in terms of aggression, where ten, men tend to be more aggressive than uh, women. Uh, and in those ways, uh, gay men uh, are more like women. But on the other hand, for the really big sex differences in behavior, those are uh, in things like interest in visual pornography, or interest in multiple partners, or interest in young partners, or interest in uh, physically attractive partners. In all of those ways, uh, gay men seem as masculine as straight men. And so I think one of the puzzles that we have to deal with uh, is uh, asking ourselves you know, how, how they can present this mosaic uh, pattern, which I think suggests that it's not going to be a simple answer. How's that for two minutes to, I mean, to say? <laughs> Plato, Plato in the Republic suggests that actually the men who are attracted to other men are the most masculine of all because they are in a realm of higher masculinity than the men who are actually drawn to the feminine and are drawn to women. So you've got some history behind you on this one. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, I think you, you, know, you asked earlier about tying it all together, and I think if there's one way we can sort of tie our research programs together, it's that we're all interested in understanding the diversity of sexuality, mm. but in, an, in as objective and in as evidence-based a manner as possible. We're interested in understanding the diversity of sexuality and how it's organized on its own terms rather than how we would like the world to be. <laughs> and that being said, you know, the science we're doing is attempting to accurately describe the world that doesn't necessarily give us any lessons about um, the kinds of societies and communities we want to live in. Um, that those 
those kinds of answers have to uh, come from from other realms of investigation. Yeah, and I would, I, I mean, picking up on that point, I would say that the diversity that I've seen in rats, lowly little, stupid, cute, <laughs> cuddly rats with tails that look like snakes that people, you know, want to exterminate. The div this diversity in, their, in, in what they're capable of learning sexually and what they're capable of doing sexually, as far as I'm concerned, they don't live in a culture that I understand, but they certainly live in the same kind of genetic diversity and behavioral diversity that I would expect of any species. And I think that gives them an edge. I think it gives all of us an edge because the asteroid hits the people that got the differences, the people that can, you know, sort of deal with that are the ones that are going to survive. The ones that do the same old, same old aren't. So you want diversity. You don't want sameness. You want difference. And I think we need to, I look at my rats and I say, embrace the difference. I look at people, I say, well, this is why we maybe can survive that asteroid and probably survive the things the dinosaurs just couldn't with their brains the size of a walnut. And their limited sexual um, attraction. Um, <laughs> Any of you who are attracted to woolly mammoths will know <laughs> that this has been a problem. Um, I just I want to sorry, make right, one, one yeah. quick comment. Um, I, one, of the, one of the key events in sort of the development of my career and the interest in getting into studying sexual orientation and particularly focusing on gender differences in sexuality had to do with working in a, in a clinic which was aimed at uh, dealing with forensically relevant problematic sexualities like pedophilia. And, and one of the big questions that, that was in my mind, I was an undergraduate at the time, I was doing you know, research assistant work, was that we were not seeing women. Why weren't we seeing women? And mm. why weren't we seeing the range of um, atypical or you know, paraphilic sexual preferences expressed among women? And, and this, for me, became a really sort of central driving um, force of, of how do you explain that gender difference? Um, and, and so, you know, responding to a little bit of what you tossed in there, yes, I absolutely do think that there are these gender differences in how sexualities unfold and manifest. We don't understand why yet, um, but, you know, we're working on it. I think I'll just close, um, because unbeknownst to all of you, we have a little clock here, which is telling us exactly where we are in the process, but by saying that to me, it's, it's incredibly interesting altogether to see the things that people want. I'm struck over and over again by the kinds of power that appeal to some people, the kinds of um, uh, strength that appeal to other people, the material things that appeal to people. I had that moment in having small children. I have a son who's now just over two years old. And I thought, why is it that he so much wants that toy and doesn't have any interest in that toy not because of the way the toys were gendered, which is another whole conversation, but just in general, the specificity of his wishes from a very early stage, not only for other people, but for a particular blanket over another blanket or a particular song over another song. And it then left me to think, you know, why do I actually like, I don't know, Chippendale furniture better than Ikea, given the choice? Where does any of it come from? Why does one have those things? And I feel as though while the investigation is already broad enough insofar as it applies to sexuality, that ultimately the heart of all of this work is to understand what longing is about and what longing is for and how incredibly broadly longing can operate in all of us for a whole variety of things and people and experiences and how that longing is actually the essence really of our humanity. So on that note, I thank you all. Thank what you. A great thank